was born in Gilgit, Baltistan, a land filled with exciting natural architecture and resources. As a child, whenever I stood gazing at the mountains, I was always in awe of the beauty and scale of it. Just the size of it made me used to feel so insignificant and so small. Nothing I said, nothing I did, or nothing I could think of could quite match the grandeur of the place. The community at large was aware of their role of stewardship for the environment and was taking care of the planet by keeping it neat, clean, and green. But like everyone else in the North, I moved to the cities. And suddenly, all the natural elements in my life were replaced by man-made ecosystems. There were no mountains, only tall buildings, no fresh water streams, but nalas that were laden with wastewater. Not only did the nalas contain wastewater, they were also filled with solid waste. Depending on where one resided in the city, the city was filled with trash. The people used to wait for authorities to come and clean it. A question that I asked myself then, and very often ask myself today, is how are people okay with it? I was not okay with the way people were living in the city. So I went to Kuri Landfill, and as I walked in into that space, a different kind of realization hit me. There were mountains of trash, except that this time, the junk was man-made. It was a parallel universe, a Himalayan equivalent of mountains of junk. Suddenly, I did not feel insignificant. I felt quite significant. And at that moment, I realized that no matter what happens, no matter what the platform, no matter what the opportunity, I will prioritize the message of sustainability in my life and in my goals. And whichever platform I get, I will put the concept of sustainability through. Now, you might be wondering, why should I care about waste management in Pakistan? Unfortunately, less than 1% of wastewater in Pakistan is being treated. That means that we are sending 99% of our wastewater into the environment without any prior treatment. This contaminated water is costing us an annual income loss of $380 million. Besides that, that wastewater enters our water streams, our land, our food, and eventually our bodies. More than 32,000 hectares of land in Pakistan is being irrigated with wastewater. There is a price that we pay for not doing anything. Human activities account for 80% of the diseases in Pakistan, and they cause 30% of the deaths. A figure that I had read that had upset me a long time ago and still upsets me every single day is that 250,000 children in Pakistan under the age of five die because of waterborne diseases. By not doing anything about wastewater treatment, not only are we depriving our future generations of the quality of life that they could have, but we are also depriving some to have the ability to have any life at all. If this doesn't alarm us, if this doesn't upset us, if this doesn't make us want to do something about the planet, I am not sure what will. So I wanted to do something about it. And by the way, you might think that wastewater is a problem of the poor only. Unfortunately, it is a problem of the entire country. It is therefore that I focused my research on wastewater treatment. I combined two membrane technologies in order to convert municipal wastewater into clean drinking water. In forward osmosis, a salt water solution through the process of osmosis attracts wastewater molecule, water molecules from the wastewater towards the salt water stream, thereby diluting the salt water stream, but also concentrating the wastewater stream. But for this process to happen continuously, the salt water stream has to be reconcentrated, which is why I had to add another membrane technology into it, which is called membrane distillation. The concept of membrane distillation is that one simply uses a waste heat 
heats up the salt solution in order to retrieve water vapors that can then be condensed on the chilled side of the membrane. So by combining these two technologies together, I was able to retrieve water from the wastewater stream to the saltwater stream, and then retrieve water from the diluted saltwater stream to a distillation setup that contained clean water only. I was super excited about the kind of work that I had done and learned, and I wanted to come back and apply it, only to come back and realize that my country is not ready for such kind of advanced technologies. So I had to sit back and reflect on the local challenge that I want to now put my focus on. Around the time, I remember that I looked around and I was reminded of the fact that wherever there's a nala, there's wastewater. Wherever there's wastewater, there's solid waste. And wherever there's solid waste, there is a huge amount of plastic pollution. So I decided that I would look at the complexity and the interrelation of this phenomenon that I had seen before I left Pakistan as well. Around that time, WWF had released a study, and that study said that the societal lifetime impact cost of plastic was three trillion US dollars in 2019. It also said that if we do not do anything about it in 2040, that cost will be seven trillion US dollars. I wanted to do something about it, both in my research and in my actions. The first thing that I wanted to do was to create as much awareness about the problem as possible. One campaign that has particularly gained a lot of attention and has brought me to places like TED was my plastic-free campaign Hunza in my own village, which we volunteered for, for the Gilgit Baltistan Environmental Protection Agency. But I realized that education awareness alone is not enough. No matter how many a times you tell people what they need to do, if it is not a part of their value system, if they do not care for the planet, they will not do it. It is therefore that together with my students, who should be sitting somewhere in the hall, we are trying to create simple, interesting pedagogical tools for students to learn these values at a much younger age. Now back to my research. I wanted to display the complexity of the issue. Generally, when water contamination is published or talked about, people only talk about four or five indicators. Bacteria, heavy metal, and maybe a few more. There is so much more that you and I chuck into that water every single day in the form of products that we use that are never monitored in our water. We do not know what kind of impact it would have on the life below and above water. One such pollutant that grabbed my attention because of that interrelation that I wanted to study was microplastic pollution. Microplastic is any plastic that is under the size of five millimeter. And while you see a lot of microplastic around you, the microplastic is not visible to the naked eye. Microplastic is generated, comes in into the environment as the microplastic itself in glitters and a lot of other cosmetic products that we use. Or it could be created from these products that we wear, for example, the plastic Led, uh, blended textile, or the microplastic that degrades and weathers and creates th those microplastic pollutants. Some of you might have read that just two days ago, microplastic was detected in human bl blood for the first time. And I think even more alarming was the fact that nearly 1.5 years ago, microplastic was detected in human placenta. Again, you're exposing a child to microplastic pollution and to pollution in general before they even enter this world. Together with my students, I wanted to look at microplastic pollution in Pakistan. And we went and tried to understand it at the lab, went and collected samples from Ravi and its adjacent drains. What you see on screen is the microplastic that we could detect from Ravi its soil samples, and then eventually to its adjacent drains. 
Microplastic pollution is not only real, it's also very, very close to home. I want you to think and know that water and wastewater and macro and microplastic pollution are all interlinked. If we want to solve one problem, we cannot do that in isolation. We have to do that in conjunction with one another. Ladies and gentlemen, we cannot continue to live the way that we have been living. Our actions are causing all of this. Our choices are causing all of this. Actions that are driven by ignorance, indifference, convenience, and affluence. It is code red for the planet. It is code red, but it is still not too late for us to reboot and rethink and start living responsibly. I'm trying to be an agent of change. I'm trying to create as many agents of change as possible. But for this transformation to happen at a much faster pace, I would need to join hands with thousands of more people like me. You would need to join hands with thousands of people like me. So I invite you today to make a choice. A choice as to whether you want to be a significant contributor to the pollution or a significant part of the solution.